All right. Appreciate your prayers this week as I shared with you. I traveled back to Cleveland, and I think Pastor Mark has warned me. Um, I would like to have seen LeBron play Tuesday night, but the tickets were just too expensive. So I went over and watched the Indians play instead, and they lost again. Uh, so it's probably a good thing I didn't go to the Quicken Loons Arena, or else maybe LeBron would have lost too. I guess I'm bad luck. Uh, but it did turn out well. Appreciate those prayers. The, the surgeon released me, and so I can get back in shape. I appreciate that. Uh, we're looking at some other things. Yeah, woo Pray for that. Unfortunately, I got another surgery coming, so don't get too excited. Uh, but a couple got three more appointments in the next six weeks. We're working on the things that are going on, but they won't keep me from being here. So I'm excited about it. We'll get back to Daniel next week. Finish Daniel up. Then where are we going? Joseph, Moses, Joshua. We're going to get the history of the Israelite people and see the redemptive story in history. So I'm looking forward to that and continuing that. We've got a break today. Wonderful message ahead of you. Uh, I'll introduce our speaker. Um, uh, I've known Keith, again, as, as a missionary to this church since I've been here as a member. And um, I, I love the way we do missions. I always have. And that was one of the things that attracted me to Winfield Baptist Church in the beginning is because we don't just do the uttermost parts. I enjoy traveling internationally. I've gone to several mission fields. Uh, I've been to Latvia. I've been some other places to do mission work. And, yes, the need is great, but we can't forget we've got a Jerusalem and a Judea and a Samaria as well. And we're supposed to minister to all those. And you don't have to look far to realize our Judea has needs. As I just shared with you, our backpack buddies feeds kids that you think, man, this is Winfield. It's kind of a fluent neighborhood. But as Doug was sharing with me, we're going to pack thousands of boxes next Saturday. We've got over 600 kids who need food. So I think sometimes we get this big, broad scope of missions, and we think, oh, missionaries are people who pack up and go overseas mm -hmm. to minister to the needs in third world countries. Well, we have those needs right here. And one of the things that really drew me to, to Keith Tyler and to FCA was where they are. They're where my kids are. I got kids in Winfield High School. You know, I had kids in Winfield Middle School. I had kids in Winfield Elementary. FCA is there sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with our kids. And it's a tremendous mission field. I shared it in the first service. I'll share it again here. Just a testimony, and I was reminded of this at the uh, Night of Champions the other night as people tell what FCA has meant to them. Uh, some of you will know who I'm talking about, but it's been several years ago that a young lady was saved through these ministries at school at lunchtime. And, and she was so excited about her salvation, and just a few weeks later, it was tested. She was in a horrible car accident um, that, you know, really when you looked at the car, you wouldn't think she should have survived. And when I saw her in the hospital, and she was still on the ventilator, she's grabbing a piece of paper to write, I need to be baptized. That's the first words that she said to me mm -hmm. in the ICU as she wrote them down, I need to be baptized. And that wasn't the only trial she would experience. She would experience the tragic loss of her father in an accident at work. And so as, as she talked, you know, without that faith, without that you know, knowledge of God and through Jesus Christ, that salvation, how could she bear those things? And, and so that happened at school, church, at school, and that's unheard of. And it is the ministries like this in our local Jerusalem and Judea uh, that are just so important. And Keith Tyler, he's the, the head here in West Virginia of our SCA, and he's going to come and share an awesome message that we all need to hear today. Thank you. Keith? Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to be back. That was a little bit better than the first service of response. <laughs> but the Lord is good. Uh, he's always good. I'm excited to be here. Uh, love Winfield community. I tell people all the time that uh, the people in Kanawha County, or some of you from Kanawha County, I'm from Kanawha County, we're crazy up here. Putnam County is great, Winfield does a great job. The public school system down here is really awesome as far as being able to do ministry, and it's just really a, an awesome privilege to be able to minister in this community. So it's always good to be here and exciting to be down here in the Winfield area. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I tell certain people, I said, man, I wish I could have lived in a Winfield community to raise my children in this community. So... It's definitely exciting to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, uh, my, my title is uh, Character in the Midst of Chaos, and I'm going to be speaking out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Uh, and the reason why I, I've been reading 2 Timothy for a while, and I said, 
you know, there's a message in that uh, scripture because of what we see going on in our society, in our public school systems, in our communities, and really all across the country. Uh, and I, my title was Character in the Midst of Chaos because I think that sometimes our character is tested because everything that goes on around us and how should we respond as the church, uh, as individuals, with so many things going on around that are so ungodly that's trying to draw us away from God. And so what is our character like in the midst of chaos? And we're going to see when Paul is writing to Timothy, trying to encourage Timothy to live out his faith in a hostile environment uh, as we go through the Scripture. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you for this great day that you have made, and we can rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Lord God, that you love us. And Lord, we pray that I would decrease and you would increase, and we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. And so when I uh, was reading uh, this scripture, I was thinking about men and women of character in the Bible, and, and I thought about uh, Joseph, when Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife when she tried uh, to sleep with him. Joseph had great character, and you know, in the end of Joseph's life, in chap Genesis chapter 50, it said, what, what you meant for bad, God meant it for good. And so Joseph had this strong character as a man of God. And then I think about Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and Daniel. Uh, they would not defile themselves by eating the king's del delicacies, nor worship the golden image. And they, if they did, they were thrown in the fiery furnace. So they had great character, even though they was in a hostile environment outside of their, their communities, and they refused to give in to something that would, that would hurt them as, as uh, people of God. And also, they did not, uh, when they did not be in, when they made the uh, statue of King Darius and said, whoever petitions any other god or man for 30 days shall be cast in the lion's den. What did Daniel do? He went home, opened his window towards Jerusalem, and he prayed and gave thanks to his God. And so you see the character of individuals, even when things don't look right, things don't go right, their backs are up against the wall, their character and their faith, it really never changed. It never really changed. And so as you see in 2 Timothy, when Paul is writing to Timothy, he's trying to tell him to be strong. He's trying to hold on. Don't give in. Don't give out. Don't throw in the towel. Don't do things that would make you look, not look like a man of God. And so he, we, as we see this, he says these, these last days that we're living in, in America, in our world, there's, a, there's no belief in God. Uh, you know, they talk about take down the Ten Commandments, no prayer in school, no public places, take Christ out of everything. Matter of fact, they don't even say, if you go through the town center mall during Easter, they don't even say Easter anymore. It's take your pictures with the bunny. And we know that uh, God, God, you can't get rid, rid of God uh, the, the, because the church is really us. We are the church. The people of God are the church. So when they say, well, you can take prayer out of school, you, can, you can't get rid of God. It just can't happen because the Bible says we are the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, and so we are the church, so we cannot be stopped, and God cannot be stopped. And so we see all these things going on in our society. No restraint from sinful behavior. Do whatever feels good, makes you happy. And we see that marriage is even looked at as old and irrelevant, and we know society is trying to change the definition of marriage. And so we as a church as a community of believers, got to stand strong, be vigilant that we're not going to give in to this world system. We're going to put our foot in the ground and we're going to hold ground that we believe that the Bible is true. And so we see everything going on in the midst of our society. Sexual perversion is at an all-time high. And I don't know if some of you might have not, some of you might have known this, that the Pornographic industry makes more money than Major League Baseball, the NFL, and the NBA. It's over a $40 billion a year industry. And so as you see this godliness in the last days, and how can the church and how can men and women of God have great character in the midst of everything that we face every day as God's people? The church is trying to be silenced by uh, society on biblical truth. We even see the church's popularity nowadays is based on the number of people in the building, the choir, a TV ministry, a pastor, not on the suffering and the serving of the lost. And so we have to be really careful about 
who we really are in Christ and what has Christ called us to do and how can we stand strong and how can we have great character as God's people when everybody else in society is saying that God doesn't matter, God doesn't exist, you can believe what you want to believe, you can live how you want to live as long as you love someone. How can we as a church maintain that godly character in the midst of so much chaos going on around us? The key is how do we respond to individuals and to the chaos around us. What type of character do we really have? And we all got to ask ourselves that because I think most of us probably work in a secular uh, job or in an industry and you're dealing with unsaved people, ungodly people. And so how do you respond in those environments as a man, a woman of God? Do they know that you love God? I used to work with a gentleman before I was a Christian, and I knew that there was something about this man because he was so different from everybody else where I worked. And I knew he had something that nobody else really had. And when I trusted Christ, I found out that this man was a Christian. He loved God. He carried himself well. He had great character in the business when everybody else was acting like clowns. And so in the midst of all the chaos that was going on in the workplace, he had great character. He never compromised his faith. And so what kind of character do we have in the midst of all the chaos that's going on around us? Charles Spurgeon said that I am certain that the safest way to defend your character is to never say a word about it. In other words is, like Frank Francis, St. Francis said, preach the gospel if necessary, use words. In other words, what he's saying, the way that you live should demonstrate that you know Christ. You shouldn't have to say anything, but the way that you live, you actually preach the good news of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The dictionary describes character as, as the way someone thinks, feels, and behaves, someone's personality. It's often said that character is what you do when no one is looking. And we all know that, that uh, almost like uh, Jonah tried to hide, he went down to Joppa, down in the bottom of the ship. He, had, he could run, but he couldn't hide. We really have nowhere to hide as God's people because God is omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent, he's everywhere. There's nowhere that you can get from God. And so character says sometimes is what you do when no one is looking, and we got to know that God sees all, knows all, so we cannot hide from God. I believe that we have to get right also in the inside of the church before we can help the outside. What are we like? Do we love each other? Do we have a spirit of unity as the church before we go out and try to witness and bring people in? Are we right on the inside? What's our character like as the body of Christ with the people that we fellowship with on Wednesday nights, on Sunday mornings? What is our character like with individuals? How can we reach the inside of, outside of the church when the inside, our character is suffering. And so Paul, knowing that he's on his way out, Paul is sort of his, his swan song. He knows that he didn't have much time left, and he knows that his, uh, uh, the time of his departure is at hand. And, and he says in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I have fought the good fight, I've kept the faith, and I've finished the race. And he said, now there's a crown in store for me, but not only me, but all those who love for this appearance. So Paul was saying to Timothy, I'm getting ready to check out of here. You got to be strong. You got to be a great man of character. You got to defend the faith, even in the midst of all the chaos that you see going on around you. And so what we'll see, the first point I want you to see that Paul really gives a warning. And we have to warn people. But see, the church has to warn people, and we can't make people think, oh, well, y'all too harsh, and you shouldn't say it like that. Oh, no, you offended me. No, we got to say, we got to tell people, you need Jesus Christ. You need to be saved. You are a sinner. You are lost. That's what we need to tell people. Rather, they like, we need to tell them the truth. You are lost, and you cannot be saved. I don't care if you go to church every Wednesday, if you Pay your tax all the time. If you have never repented of your sins and put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you are lost. And Paul is warning Timothy. He said, Timothy, but know this, that perilous times will come. And so we have to warn our family. We have to warn our friends. We have to warn our co-workers that the end is near and the perilous times are already here. We are in a mess as a country, and everybody in here knows that. 
It is a mess what we see going on around us and on our television with our sports, our entertainment, everything that we see, it is a mess. And so he talks about this warning that we have to give people and we have to warn people about these perilous times that are happening, that are happening. Uh, we got to keep warning people as the word of God does. First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so when you think about the devil who prowls around like a roaring lion, a lion, when you watch the Discovery Channel, how he blends in with the brush and you cannot see him and he can get right up on you before you see him. And that's what this world does to our young people and it does to our adults. It, it sneaks up on you and you can't see the, the, the carnage that the world is trying to bring on the church and on people. Then all of a sudden, the lion pounces on you, the world pounces on you, and then all of a sudden, the church or individuals start saying, oh, well, they okay. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. And so we got to warn people because the Bible warns people about the enemy. Then it also says in Ephesians 6, 11, put on the full armor of God so we can withstand the wiles of the devil, his schemes, his devices. And so we got to put on the full armor of God and we got to keep it on. We can't take it on and off. We got to keep it on at all times, 24, 7, 365, 366 during the leap year. We got to keep our armor on at all times. So Paul warns Timothy, perilous times are here. And then he says, not only after warning, he says, the next point is the wickedness of men. So he gives a warning, then he talks about the wickedness of men, and we're not going to go through all of those, almost ran out of time first service. <laughs> so, the wickedness of men, chaos in the midst of, a character in the midst of chaos. He says this, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. So he gives the warning. Then he says, look at the wickedness of men in our society, in our country. The first of all, he said, men will be lovers of themselves, and that's a major problem in our society when we love ourselves. There's nowhere in the Bible where the Word of God tells us to love ourselves. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But it doesn't tell us to love ourselves, because if we loved ourselves, we would not love others. It would be hard to love others if we were always focused on ourselves. And we know that's part of our sinful nature because this this humanness and I said we still in this unredeemed Adam suit and so sometimes we whatever we want to make ourselves feel good and we we love ourselves and we shouldn't do that we should not love ourselves we should love others just as it says in Ephesians how men ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies and so but we can't love ourselves and so when men love themselves chaos is going to happen Here's why they love themselves. It's all about them. When someone says, I did it, I did this, I, I started that program, I'm the best, just get out of the way and watch them crash. It's dangerous to be around somebody who loves themselves and talks about themselves and brags on themselves all the time. And the Bible says that no flesh should glory in the presence of God. The Word of God says in Isaiah 48, 11, that he will not give his glory to another. And so God will not give his glory to another. So when men love themselves, it's a form of wickedness according to the word of God. And so we have all this chaos going on around us when it's all about us. And society is saying, get what you want, get it now, get as much as you can, keep up with the Joneses, be the best you, you can be. And it's a problem when we do that as a society. And the church and the people of God should be the last ones that when we're trying to love ourselves or put our up on a pedestal. Then he says, not only that, he lovers of money. When you love money, you can't love God. You can't serve God and man because you either love the one or hate the other. First Timothy 6, 6 through 10 says that godliness with great content, with great gain, with contentment is great gain, for we bought nothing in this world and it's certain that we can carry nothing out of it. You can take nothing out of this world. 
when we accumulate, we, we, we can't take it out of this world. And so he says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And so you cannot love money. If you love money, you can't love God. You can't love others. Then he says boastful. Look at me. They are the know-it-alls who try to deceive people in thinking they're brilliant. Proud, self-exalting, and determined to have their own way. It describes the Pharisee stood praying to himself, I thank God be, that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer. But the tax gatherer would not even look up to heaven, but beating his breast, said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Blasphemers, abusive and slanderers, disobedient to parents. And we don't even really even need to talk about that because we see that happening in our society so much where young people don't respect authority or they don't respect parents. And it's not everybody, but the television and our culture is trying to tell kids that they can do what they want and they have rights. They don't have no rights if they ain't paying no bills. They ain't buying no clothes. They ain't bringing no food in the house. Now, I'm being honest. You know that, that we have to stick to the word of God. Uh, 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 children ought to obey their parents in the Lord. If they do, their days will be long on the earth. And what we've done, we're trying to be friends with our kids. I told my kids, I don't care if you like me or not. This is the way it is. You can be mad all you want. This is the way we're going to do it. And I don't care if you don't say how, speak to me no more. The Bible says that I'm the leader of this home, and this is the way I'm going to lead. And they rebel, for, but that's part of it. But you know what? They said when they get old, they won't depart. They'll come back. But we got to show our kids that we love them by discipline and by making them stick to the Word of God. And so we have so many young people in our society today that are disobedient to their parents. Unthankful. I deserve everything I receive, and I don't need to say thanks. We have people like an unholy person driven by self-love to gratify his lust and passions or whatever sort. W unloving. This is really, when I was reading and studying this, I looked at unloving and looked at some of my commentaries, and it was really thinking about without natural affection. It's like, and it speaks of somebody that would abuse their own child. And so look at the wickedness that we see in our society that's going on. And how can you have great character as a man or woman of God in the midst of the chaos that we see every day on the television, in our schools, in our workplaces? We see people that are unloving, unforgiving. They will go to their grave before they apologize. They will go to the grave before they say, I'm sorry. You have to apologize. You have to forgive because God has forgiven us. Then it says, slanders that goes to harm others, others to promote their self-interest. They want to damage someone's reputation without self-control. No moral limit. Everything goes as long as I get pleasure and satisfaction. They become slaves to their own passion and ambition. Brutal speaks of savagery like that of a wild beast. Despisers of good. Despisers of good. Now this is really, when you think about this character in the midst of chaos, they despise good. Listen to what Isaiah 5, chapter 5, verse 20 says. It says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, and who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Boy, isn't that what we're doing in our society today? They're calling darkness light and light darkness. When you say a biblical marriage is between a man and a woman, and they say, no, it's not, they're calling darkness light. Boy, all this mess going on around us in the church, we have to stand strong. We got to be vigilant to continue to stand on the word of God as God's people. And Paul, the apostle Paul, is telling Timothy, listen, Timothy, you can do it. I know you're young in the faith, but you can do it in this hostile environment in the, in the city of Ephesus where there's so much uh, false teaching and uh, idol worship going on, and he's telling Timothy that you can be this man that God wants you to be. Traitors, 
who would turn, <laughs> they turn on you in a minute. Friends, family, job. It's like a Judas. They'll turn on you in a minute. Headstrong, reckless, preoccupied with his or her own interests, could care less about those around them. Haughty, they conceited, have a high view of oneself. Lovers of pleasure that, rather than lovers of God. So they love pleasure rather than lovers of God. In other words, the true God has no place at all in their thinking and living of a false teacher, anyone else who is self-centered. Here's what John, in John chapter 3, verse 19, said Jesus told Nicodemus, and this is the judgment that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. And so they have a form of godliness but denying its power. And it says of such people turn away. Having a form of God but denying his power. The word form comes from the word like morphous, which refers to an outward shape or an appearance. In other words, it's Christianity without substance. There's no substance to it. They have a form of God in this, but they deny the power. Oh, God can't bring healing. God can't bring deliverance. God can't set somebody free. They just have a form. They have a surface Christianity. They don't really know God. They know about God, but they don't really know God intimately. And so they have this form of godliness. Do, do we have a form or are we really changed on the inside? They deny the power of God. That's how you know they have not been changed. Now we'll see not only the, we saw the warning, the wickedness. Now we'll see the weakness of men. The weakness of men. And we have to be strong as the church, as men and women of God and bold in our faith. And I was this very shy and timid, timid person growing up. But when I got saved and I started reading the Word of God, it gave me a boldness that I did not have, not in myself, but in the Scriptures, in the Word of God. I was at a conference. It was about 280, 300 people, and I prayed in Jesus' name. And a woman came up to me and said, why did you pray in that name? I said, ma'am, that's the only name I know that I'll pray in. If you didn't like it, too bad. Why did you? Because that's the only name. That's the only name. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. And there's no other name under heaven given among men where men where, whereby we must be saved. It's at the name of Jesus. It's at the name of Jesus. And now we'll see the weakness of men. Look at verse 6 through 9. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so we see this, there, there's a weakness there, and the word creep carries the ideal of stealth, and therefore of a creeping in undetected. A creeping in undetected. In other words, is the enemy, the false teachers, this world system will creep in on you undetected. They will lure you to sleep with television, with Facebook, with internet, with MySpace, with Instagram, all the crazy sitcoms that are so ungodly, they lure you to sleep and they'll have you laughing and in your living room and clapping and all of a sudden they just lure you to sleep. And it's a form of weakness. And what you should do is turn the channel, I'm not going to watch that. It's a form of weakness, and when you're weak, you can't have this strong character in the midst of all the chaos that's going on around us in our society. Jude 4 says that certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our, and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we got to make sure that we're not weak as God's people. And here's why... Uh, when he says, talk about uh, weak women, gullible women, it says women were vulnerable because they were, in that society, were uneducated, a lot of them. So it wasn't appropriate for men to approach a woman because of their marriage. So they wouldn't approach them in the community or out in the streets, and so they would come to their homes. And so it speaks of how this, if, if you weaken your faith, you can be lured into believing and doing things that would cause you to sin and sin against God. If you're weak and vulnerable, it's easy to be seduced into believing something that is a lie. And if you are loaded down with sins and guilt, doctrine could take you deeper into sin. Wrong doctrine can take you deeper into sin. God wants all of his children to have the knowledge of the truth because he says, 
always learning, verse 7, and able, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. See, the word of God is true. It, it is true. It does not change. It's infallible. God cannot lie. The Bible says his word has been settled in heaven. We have the truth right here, and we got to stand on it regardless of what's going on around us. Stand on the truth and God's word. And so John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. First Timothy 2, 4, God desire all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. If you don't know the truth, man, you could be seduced in anything. What kind of character do you really have, church, in the midst of everything that's going on around us? Oh, my goodness. And the young people, oh, we got to pray for our young people. We got to pray for our young people. I've been doing FCA for 17 years, and it's different. It's different. When I first started, our high school ministry dominated it. Dominated FCA. I mean, every high school, there was 40 to 150, 200 kids in FCA. Now it's the middle school that's dominating, and the high school numbers are shrinking because this world is trying to suck our kids' life out of them. And so we got to pray for our children. We got to hold them accountable. We got to teach them the Word of God. We cannot compromise what we believe and how they believe it, regardless of how mad they get at you as your mother and your father or guardian. We got to help our young people be all that God desires for them to be. We got to teach them the truth of God. And then he says, uh, always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, Janus and Jambres resisted Moses. Do these also resist the truth? Men of corrupt mind disapprove concerning the faith. And so it says that Janus and Jambres may have been among the magicians in Pharaoh's court who duplicated many of the miracles the Lord performed through Moses. And listen to this. Janus, I think I'm saying his name right, means he who seduces, and Jambres, he who makes rebellion. He who makes rebellion. We can't not be weak and anemic if we want to be bold for God. You know what, the church, we've got to be so excited about serving and celebrating and worshiping God. And you probably heard this, you go to a ball game and somebody scores a field goal or a touchdown, or, and man, we just cheer and we just holler and we scream and clap and we yell at the rest for a bad call. And then when we come to church and they sing into the glory of God and we don't even open our mouths. Man. We have the truth. We have God's word. We got to be all that God wants us to be. Now we'll see the witness of Paul. The witness of Paul, verses 10 through 15. Let's look at that right quick. The witness of Paul. So he talks about this warning, the wickedness, uh, and then we'll see the witness of Paul, the weakness, the witness of Paul. He says in verse 10, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecution, affliction, which happened to me at Antioch, and Iconium and at Lystra, what persecution I do, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. That's a sermon within itself. What kind of witness do we have? Are you being an example to your children, your family, your co-workers, friends, enemies, and even uh, the church can follow? What kind of witness do we have in the midst of everything that's going on around? Paul had great character in the midst of everything that he went through. And he's telling Timothy, look, I went through all of this, and I did not compromise my faith. I did not give in. I did not throw in the towel. I stood true to the word of God, even when I was being stoned, even when I was shipwrecked, when I was left for dead, when they said I wasn't an apostle. He said, I did not give in. Paul's character was the same in a hostile environment. His witness was incredible. Paul's life was on an open book. It was on display. You know, and I said, our lives should really be on display as Christians. What should we have? We should have nothing to hide as God's people, as Christians, because we've been called out of the world into the marvelous light. We've been called out of darkness into light. And so our life, the Bible says that we should let our light shine before men, that he may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And so we have this witness. Our life should be on display. When people see us, they see Christ in us. And that's what Paul was saying. My life was on display. It didn't look like I was winning, but I was winning. And that's what we got to get as God's people. It don't look like we're winning all the time. You can have wayward children, marriage struggling, financial issues, but it might not look like we're winning, but we are. You know why we're winning? 
Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death on the cross. He rose again. Our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The Bible says no one can snatch us out of his hand. And so we went, we're winning. We've already won. We've already won, and we just got to hang in there. We got to hang in there in the midst of all this mess going on around us. We got to hang in there and have great character in the midst of all this chaos. In the midst of all this chaos. So many, claiming, uh, uh, so many are claiming to be blessed, but their testimony is a mess. So we got to make sure that our walk and our witness lines up to what we say and what we believe. Verse 10, but you have carefully followed my daughter Paul. He followed Paul's study uh, with a, within close quarters. His doctrine it included all the things with Timothy heard Paul from Paul, his manner of life, his conduct, Paul's lifestyle. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ is a new creature, old things have passed, all things have become new. Our lifestyle changes in the midst of everything that's going on. All the chaos is going on around us. His purpose, preaching the gospel, that was Paul's purpose in preaching the word. Paul says in Acts 20, 24, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish the race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of grace. So he said, I don't even count my life dear to myself because I want to finish this race that God has called me to finish and to run. Paul's life was on display. He had an incredible witness. And he talked about his faith, his faithfulness, his faithfulness. Uh, he, 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 he had to remain faithful and have the spirit of trustworthy. He's not talking about saving faith. He's talking about his faithfulness to God. His long suffering, his patience, hang in there, don't give up. His love, agape love, not a superficial love. Not a superficial love. Paul talks about this, this long suffering, this love. It's not a superficial, it's a gospel, uh, an agape love where you seek the highest good of another person. Love. Think about this. When you hear, you know, I hope I don't anybody when they say, you know, I don't love you anymore, or I fell out of love. Well, when you think about that, it's really impossible to fall out of love. Because the agape love, and the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that love never fails. So in other words is you had the wrong kind of love. You didn't have the love that God has for us where you seek the highest good for someone else. So Paul's whole life was ministering the gospel, trying to get people saved. He loved people. He was stumped, but he kept preaching the gospel. He loved Tim Timothy, and he even said, bring John Mark. He's useful for me in the ministry. Paul loved him. It wasn't this superficial love where we say we love somebody and we really don't love them with the agape love that Jesus Christ loved us. So Paul talks about his love, his perseverance, to bear up under great trial. Don't Give in to bear up under great trial. And I tell you what, we as the people of God, I'm telling you, here in 10 or 15, 20 years, uh, it's going to be rough for us. I, I, I really think it's going to be rough for the church and the people of God. It, it's, it's coming. Where we're we're going to be looked at as, I mean, it's going to be hard for us. We, we're probably going to be, they'll probably have people standing in the back of the church making sure we don't say something that's going to offend somebody. It's, I'm telling it's coming. It's coming. And so, but you know what? When we stand strong and stand on the word of God, we can stop all of that. So he says, his affliction, suffering, Paul it was stoned and lished. Romans 8, 18, here's what he says. For the present suffering at this time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that should be revealed in us. And so the suffering are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. And now let's look at the we're going to drop down to the last point. I'm going to skip a few verses. Uh, verses 14 and 15. The witness of his family. So he's writing to Timothy. He says this, But you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing whom, from whom you have learned them. So Paul tells Timothy, Don't forget about your grandmother and your mother. They taught you the scriptures. So not only Paul talked about his witness, he said, Timothy, you have a witness also. And that's why I think it's so important for we as parents and grandparents and guardians to be that witness in front of our children. We have to be that witness. We got to 
you know, you hear this joke, well, I was, I was drugged as a child, drugged to church. We've got to bring them to church, make them go to Sunday school. And I said make, make them come to church. As long as you're paying the bills and feeding them, you make them come. When they get grown, they can make their own decision. Make them come to church. Don't let them stay home and play Xbox and on Facebook. Uh, make them come. They'll appreciate it in the long run. I guarantee it. They will appreciate it down the road when they start a family and they have children. They'll appreciate it. You're planting seeds. You're showing them how a man and, and woman of God should live and raise up their children. So, so he says he has a, a great witness from his family. He talked about his spiritual foundation. We've got to continue to give our kids a spiritual foundation. But he says this, that it will make you wise for salvation. Because he says, uh, let me find it. You have known the childhood from the, the you from your childhood. You have known the Holy Scripture will make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So it says it'll make you wise for salvation. Here's what I get from that: We're saved, we're being saved, and we shall be saved. It's a process. We're going through this. We're saved, we're being saved, and we shall be saved. And so Paul is telling Timothy, it's going to make you wise for salvation the things you've learned from your grandmother and your, mother, and your mother. And the last point I want you to see is the Word has power to help us to have great character in the midst of so much chaos going on around us. It says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, it's God breathed. It's God breathed out. He, God breathed, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it says, not some of it, all of it. Uh, the Bible says that every, uh, it said his word has been settled in heaven. It says the word of God is sharper and active than a two-edged sword. Uh, then it says it's profitable for teaching, doctrine, reproof, conviction, setting right, correction, discipline, instruction. It's God breathed. God, he breathed out by God from Genesis to Revelation, the word of God. It's able to help us as we go through this life with all the chaos that's going on around us. Here's what it says in Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And Psalm says, forever, O Lord, your words have been settled in heaven. What kind of character do we have in the midst of all the chaos that's going on around us? And one of the things we must do, we must study the word of God to help us to be all that we can be in Christ Jesus when things around us are so chaotic and out of control. Paul is telling Timothy, listen, get it together. Here's why you need to get it together. There's so much going on around you, but you can do it. And so my word to the Winfield Baptist Church and to myself, even with all the chaos that's going on around me, what is my character like as a man of God, as a father and as a husband? What is your character like? when we're not in church, when we're on our jobs, in our communities, what is our character like? And so I want to encourage you uh, to have great character in the midst of so much chaos. Thank you. God bless.
discovered that she belongs The taste of and with all the knees now hanging on Discovered that she belonged We hid and we ran word today and, and if you've heard his voice specifically about something from the message maybe your character uh, has been called to question today not by uh, brother Keith but by the word and so I challenge you pastor Andrew will stick down front if there's chaos in your life and you just want somebody to pray with you over it, we'd be glad to do that that's what we're here for equipping the saints and uh, again we know your world we've been in your world we have our own and so if there's any challenges you need help with again don't leave with those uh, today is the day to deal with them. Love you dearly. Look forward to seeing you back Wednesday night for Bible.